Today we're going to be taking a look at a beginner's guide to automation and oxygen not included. Automation can be quite intimidating at a glance, but we're going to try to break it down in a beginner friendly way and show you some practical applications on how you can use automation to make your base more efficient, conserve resources, and ultimately lead your colony into the mid and late game portions of your playthrough. We'll take a look at some sensors and logic gates and how to use them. As with most of my tutorials, this is catered towards beginners. If you're a more experienced player, feel free to follow along and let me know if you were able to learn anything. But even if you didn't, feel free to leave your feedback in the comments below. And if you're a new player, feel free to ask questions down in the comments below or let me know your feedback and if this video was helpful for your playthroughs. Regardless of what your experience level is, thank you for watching and with that, let's get straight into the video. The first thing we'll take a look at is inputs and outputs. Most buildings in Oxygen Not Included have an input that you can hook automation up to and an output. An output is usually in the form of a sensor or a manual switch, but it can also apply to other buildings as well. An input is usually directly connected to a building that you want to control via a sensor or some other method. Outputs have a black outline around a white fork and inputs have a white outline around a dark fork. You can always hover over and it will tell you if it's an output or an input. Once there's automation wire connected to one of the ports, the automation wire will change color depending on what signal it's currently being received. Obviously, if you want to use the signal switch to control the gas pump, you will have to hook it up directly to the gas pump and then turn the switch on, which will then send a green signal to the gas pump. A more common and practical method to using a gas pump would be to hook it up to an Atmo sensor. The Atmo sensor will measure if the gas pressure is within a selected range in the atmosphere surrounding it. This value can be adjusted by clicking on the Atmos sensor and changing the send green signal if setting, whether it's above or below the number that you select. It will also tell you the current ambient pressure and the animation will change depending on if it's sending a green signal or a red signal. However, you can always display this information by clicking on the automation overlay. If you hook up two separate sensors or output methods into a one singular input method, you may get conflicting results with the output. This is because buildings are not meant to have two output settings connected to one another. This is where something like logic gates come into play. Let's take a look at some of the different types of sensors that you'll be using throughout your playthrough. These sensors will generally be used to control one type of building or one type of function. However, they can be combined using logic gates to control more advanced and more complicated methods of running your base. We'll go over all this in a later portion of this video. But for now, let's focus on how each of these sensors works and what you would use them for in a practical situation. Let's start with gases. For gas, we have the Atmo sensor. The Atmo sensor can be programmed to send a green signal if the current ambient pressure is above or below your current set amount. You'll likely be using this in situations where you don't want to vacuum out an entire room if you're trying to move one type of gas to another location. If you don't have an Atmo sensor, the gas pump will just continuously work until there is no more gas to suction out of the room. An Atmo sensor will limit this from happening and it will also ensure that you're sending full packets of whatever substance you're trying to move so you're not wasting energy on sending smaller packets. The gas element sensor will send the green signal if your selected gas is currently being detected by the sensor. For example, if I set it to chlorine, it will send a red signal. But since we have natural gas in this room, if I select natural gas, it will send green. The hydro sensor works exactly the same way, except it's for liquid applications. You could choose to send a green signal if it's above or below your target limit. You'll likely want to use this in similar applications where you don't want to withdraw all of the liquid in a particular room, and the hydro sensors mainly use this as a control to ensure that you're sending full packets of liquid instead of sending partial or very small packets, because this wastes power. It takes the same amount of power to send a 1 kilogram packet of liquid as it does to send a full 10 kilogram packet of liquid. So the hydro sensor allows your liquid pump to work more efficiently by limiting when it turns off and on. And the liquid element sensor works exactly the same way as the gas element sensor. It will send a green signal or a red signal depending on what substance it's surrounded by and what you choose. In this case, we're using brine, so selecting brine will send a green signal. The thermal sensor can be used for multi-purpose applications. It can be used in a gas and it can be used in a liquid. It works exactly the same way in each substance. Currently the ambient temperature is 17 degrees in this polluted oxygen, so I can send a green signal depending on what option I toggle. And it works the same way in any sort of liquid, whether it's water or brine. The cycle sensor works on the internal clock of your asteroid and it allows you to set the activation time, whether it's the day or night, and the duration. So for example, if you want something to only work on at the nighttime, you can set the activation time to overlap with the nighttime of your asteroid. The timer sensor is very similar, but it works on its own internal time frame and does not have any ties to the asteroid's time of day. You can increase the green duration or the red duration, 
the sum of the green duration and the red duration signals will set the overall time it takes for the timer sensor to complete one lap. This means that if both signals are set to 10 seconds, it will take 20 seconds for one lap to be completed in total. There are several other sensors that we did not discuss, such as the weight plate, motion sensor, germ sensor, duplicate checkpoint, and so on. These are relatively straightforward and follow the exact same concept and principles as all the other sensors that we've talked about so far. Essentially, they're looking for a criteria to be met in order to send a green or red signal, depending on the orientation of the sensor. Consider experimenting with different types of sensors and different locations and different configurations in order to find the optimal setup for your builds. Logic gates are very similar in that they all have an input and an output. However, usually they will have more than one input and one singular output depending on what configuration you're trying to use. In this case, I'm using an AND gate and we'll go over all the gates in just a bit. But to demonstrate how a logic gate works, essentially an AND gate will receive two different types of output from two different sensors. This could be two Atmos sensors, it could be an Atmos sensor and a signal switch. It really doesn't matter. An AND gate will take two separate outputs and only send a green signal when both of those outputs are green. For example, if I change this Atmos sensor to send the green signal, because the pressure in this room is adequate to my liking, it will send the green signal into the AND gate. However, the AND gate will not send that green signal to the building that I want to control unless the secondary signal is also set to green. This allows you to have two different ways to control one singular building. Then once this Atmos sensor has depleted far enough that it is no longer sending a green signal, the AND gate will no longer be receiving two green signals either, so it will send a red signal to the gas pump. Let's take a look at the NOT gate. The NOT gate is something that you're going to be using quite frequently once you get to the mid or late stages of the game. The NOT gate will simply revert the signal that is being received by whatever output device you're using into the opposite signal. So if your output device is sending a green signal, the NOT gate will transform it into a red signal and therefore turn off the building that it's connected to. If this signal becomes red, then the output signal becomes green and the building will start to function. An OR gate will work similar to the AND gate, however, only one signal needs to be green instead of both. For example, if we have two green signals coming into the AND gate, this building would turn on. However, in the AND gate, if one of the signals was to turn red, this would shut off. With the OR gate, that doesn't happen. The OR gate will receive two signals, and only one of them has to be green in order to turn on this building. It can be either the left or the right signal, or both. But if both signals that are coming into the OR gate are red, the building will shut off. This is not to be confused with the XOR gate. The XOR gate will only send a green signal if either the right or the left output is giving it a green signal, but not both. This means that the condition in order to send a green signal from the XOR gate has to be one output that is green, but not both. The buffer gate is a very useful building that you're likely going to use quite often in your playthroughs. The buffer gate is very simple. When a green signal is received, it will send a green signal out of the buffer gate. But as soon as this signal changes to red, it will start a countdown sequence. During this countdown sequence, the output signal will remain green until the countdown clock has hit zero. Of course, this countdown clock is adjustable by clicking on the buffer gate and setting it to whatever you like. A practical application to using the buffer gate is clearing out large portions of liquid from a piping system. For example, this buffer gate that I'm using for this hydrogen vent tamer is set to 10 seconds. Whenever the liquid pipe thermal sensor senses that the temperature is above a certain range, it will send the green signal to the buffer gate, which will turn on the liquid shutoff and drain the coolant that is in the pipe. However, because I'm dealing with very hot temperatures coming out of the hydrogen vent, I want the pipe to continue draining until there's only cool liquid left, so I have a small 10 second buffer, so it will continue to flush the pipes until only cool liquid is left in them. A filter gate is directly the opposite of a buffer gate. A filter gate will only send a green signal from its output when the green signal to its input has satisfied the countdown clock. And of course, this is a countdown clock that you set. This may be useful for applications where you're getting a signal that is constantly bouncing back and forth between green and red, and you don't want to accidentally trigger a building into turning on or off unless a certain amount of time has passed. You can see that when I keep the signal switch on for the set amount of time and the countdown clock hits zero, it allows the green signal to pass through. Then as soon as the input signal turns to red, the whole system shuts off. A signal distributor can be quite complicated and there are very little uses for the early or mid game for a signal distributor. However, you may find more uses for it in the late game. Nonetheless, it's pretty cool to use, so let's go over how it works. What's unique about this signal distributor is that it has two inputs that are simply control inputs. And these two control inputs allow you to send one signal into four separate directions. You could have two separate signal switches controlling the single output location. 
but rather than trying to explain a scenario, let's take a look at exactly how it works. When the main input signal switch is set to green, it will take a path through the signal distributor depending on which configuration the control switches are activated in. You can see that the far right control switch controls two toggles on the right side, and the left control switch controls a single toggle on the left side. If you follow the path for the signal coming from the input, you can see which output it's trying to reach. If just one of the control switches is not in the correct orientation, the signal will not pass through. And finally, we have the signal selector, which is the direct opposite of the signal distributor. The signal selector will take four different inputs and choose which of the inputs gets passed through to the gas pump, depending on which configuration the control switches are set to. For example, we have this green input coming into the signal selector, and we want to pass it down through our gas pump. This can be achieved by setting the control switches into the correct orientation. This will allow only one of the four input signals to be passed through to the building that you want to control. Likewise with the signal distributor, this has very niche uses. However, as you expand your base, you may find more uses for it in the late game. Automation ribbons are kind of cool and they can be used to transport four signals rather than just one in a singular game cell. For example, if you had four ceiling lights that you wanted to control from four different locations, you'd have to send four singular strands of automation wire, which would take up a lot of space and it would look very messy in your overall layout of your base. However, this will do the job just fine, allowing each individual switch to control each individual light. The automation ribbon does the exact same thing, except that it allows you to run a single ribbon to keep everything looking neat and tidy. In order to use the automation ribbon, you must have a ribbon writer and a ribbon reader. The ribbon writer gets connected to your automation ribbon via its custom port. And naturally, it has a input location. When you click on the ribbon writer, there will be four bits in the configuration menu, and you can select bit one, two, three, or four, in order for the input signal of the ribbon rider to be taken through the corresponding ribbon. The top ribbon rider I have set to bit 1, the second one farther down I have set to bit 2, then my ribbon readers will read which bit that I'm trying to access, and send an output signal to my ceiling light. The first one is bit 1, the second one is bit 2, the third is bit 3, and the fourth is bit 4. So when I zoom out and I turn on the top signal switch, it will turn on the first light. The second signal switch will turn on the second light, the third will turn on the third light, and naturally the fourth will turn on the fourth light. And this allows you to keep sending multiple signals on a single ribbon. The ribbon doesn't necessarily have to be controlling the exact same building or similar building. You can use it to simply transport multiple signals throughout your base and then have it branch off at your desired locations. They also don't need to be in order. For example, you can select any ribbon reader to read any bit that you want. If we just change these around a bit, now the signal switch will control completely different lights. And of course, you can make it so one signal switch controls multiple lights. It's pretty fun to use, and I encourage you to use it. However, keep in mind that the automation ribbon takes five times as much refined metal as the single automation wire. This means you're essentially paying for an additional automation wire that you're not getting. Whether or not it's worth it is up to you, but keep in mind that building it will not only save duplicate labor, but it will also help keep your base looking tidier. So it may be worth it in the end. Automation is frequently used in order to prevent things from catastrophically collapsing within your base. It is also used to prevent excessive power from being used for no reason. For example, the aqua tuners are being turned off by the liquid pipe thermal sensor when the temperature inside the pipes that is passing through has reached a certain temperature. This allows me to save 1200 watts each time liquid is passing through that I no longer need to be cooling farther. Some other applications could be a liquid reservoir sending a red signal when it is sufficiently full so the oil refineries stop producing oil. This saves my duplicates from continuing to work on the oil refinery when I don't need any more oil. Smart batteries almost always have an automation wire hooked up to it, otherwise there's no point in using them. The smart battery will turn off certain energy producers, which can be set to various different thresholds to allow your base to function on more than one type of power and to prioritize using one form of power over another. Another application for the Atmo sensor is to only turn on the carbon skimmers when sufficient carbon has accumulated in the vicinity. This allows me to save on polluted water and energy by not running the carbon skimmers when they don't need to be running. And down here, I'm using the hydro sensor to only send large packets of water through this pipe. This saves me power by not sending small packets of water that would use the exact same amount of power as large packets. Automation is used nearly everywhere in Oxygen Not Included, and it is an incredibly powerful tool that you need to learn in order to advance into the mid and late game phases of the game. This industrial brick is featured in its own video, so if you would like to learn how to build it, go ahead and check that out in the link above. And there you have it, an introduction to automation in Oxygen Not Included. If you were able to learn anything, please feel free to let me know in the comments below. Also, if you don't mind, please leave a rating, as comments and ratings both help tremendously in getting the video out to more people in the algorithm. 
And if you're not subscribed already, please hit that subscribe button. If you enjoyed, I would love to have you around for future videos. And of course, thank you to my supporters who have been with me since the start. It's because of you that I have the motivation to continue to make these videos. I'm incredibly thankful for your support and the kind words that you leave for me in the comments. And with that, I'm Ethan, and I'll talk to you guys in the next one.